Welcome back to One Stitch in the Veil. This is Relationships Part 5, the final installment in the Relationship series. I've taken several months to go behind the scenes, to speak with some of you, to have a couple Bible studies, two of which will be ongoing from here on out until the Lord changes my direction. Um, I hope to be in those for a while. So we're back with Relationships 5 to finish up friendships. We were going to discuss adult children, but there is a video, a three-part series with my friend Avery called A Father's Testimony, and I think he does a wonderful job in that video. For those of you who have adult children in this movement, he gives biblical uh, foundation and scripture, wisdom for handling those things. He talks about his own journey. One of the key points and my favorite thing that he said through any relationship is that if we are faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we are faithful to our God in our relationships and we lose a relationship, the loss of that relationship is a sad thing, but sometimes that happens. Now, if we have been unfaithful, perhaps that we haven't reached out and tried to lovingly bring someone back who is in sin or is lost, or being deceived, if we haven't been faithful to Christ and try to bring them back with all love, if we have not gone ahead and said, I made some mistakes in that relationship. I was unfaithful in my behavior. I was unfaithful in, um, I was harsh. I had a rude tone. Um, I sinned against them in contending for the faith. Then we need to go and make that right because in that case we have been unfaithful to the gospel in our desire to be faithful and sometimes that happens so go and take a look if you have children who are adults they're no longer living in the home so you don't have that parental authority that you once had you don't have that hand in their lives to be able to bring them back from things they might be into and you're needing to treat them very much like a respected adult individual who makes their own decisions and their own choices. Um, Avery's video would be wonderful uh, to go and watch, learn and listen, learn from uh, his very humble heart in some of the mistakes he made, learn from uh, his, his biblical wisdom in remaining faithful to the gospel and at the same time risking relationship loss for the sake of the gospel, but in all love as you contend. So speaking of contending, we're gonna walk through a couple things. Uh, we know that Christ calls us to peace. Peace wherever it is possible for us to have. So we want to have peace. But there is something, a phrase, called peace at any cost. We are not called to have peace at any cost. How do we know this? Because even though that sounds nice and that sounds very peaceful and it sounds right, can you think of anything in this world that causes more unrest and more unpeace than sometimes just being a Christian, than sometimes just being a Jew, than loving God, standing for God, proclaiming God, being one of his people? There is a lot of persecution sometimes just for being, even when you aren't contending, even when you aren't speaking, even when you aren't on the battlefield for Christ, you can be persecuted just because you are. And so there is a lot of risk to not keeping peace just by being a Christian and other things as well, but in this case, in being a Christian. So you can imagine that if you are to speak, even in love, even gently, and point out something that is not Christ-like and try to bring a brother or sister back, that that has potential to cause a great uh, unrest, a division, and not peace. But we're also told in scripture that we are to contend for the faith, that when a brother or sister goes astray, that we're to bear their burden, we're to, to gently restore, not harshly, but gently restore them. And that naturally is going to cause, sometimes, us not to have peace. So when we're told to have peace with one another and to have unity and to fight for that, at the same time, we are not called to peace at any cost. 
So we could have peace, but not when we put the gospel at stake. We can have peace, but not at the cost of usurping the cross or staying quiet when we see someone go astray. So we need to understand that this peace is peace so long as it depends on you, so long as it depends on me, so long as it depends on us, and understanding that if we have been faithful to the gospel, if we have gone and put on our boots of peace, because you know, sometimes we just put on that armor. We put on the armor of God like we're supposed to. We have our sword and our shield and our helmet and our breastplate and our belt of truth. Uh, we forget to put on those boots sometimes, those boots of peace. And those are so important. So when we're faithful and we're contending, we can be bold, we can be firm, we can be straightforward, and we need to be, but we also need to be loving and we need to be gentle as we, re as we restore. So just remember those boots of peace. And if you have your armor and you are sharing the gospel and you're going to a loved one saying, hey, a friend, you're saying, hey, what you're doing and what you're believing so long as you have an understanding of what they're doing and believing, go ahead and ask, start with questions. And then if they are deceived, say, hey, you know what? That's not the truth, sister or brother. That's not the truth. That's not the gospel. Come on back. Will you dive in the word with me? Will you research this, this out with me? Can we talk? And sometimes the answer will be yes. Often in Hebrew roots, I'm seeing that answer is no or you're met with an answer of, well, you just need to go read your Bible, or I don't want to argue about it, or that's what God said, not me, or you're lawless. Um, and, and other terms, those of you who have been in those conversations, you know. Um, you can look in the comments to a lot of my videos, and you'll see there's a challenge in having a peaceful conversation sometimes, and sometimes the conversation is just shut down. But if we are faithful, we don't, we don't dull our sword for the sake of uh, loving someone and bringing them back but we do put on our boots of peace and so when you've done that and you've gone and you've warned and you've loved and you've compelled and you've said come back come back come back in whatever way the Holy Spirit leads you to say that within biblical leading and you lose that relationship or you're met with volatility you're met with harshness you're met with a closed door if you've lost that relationship and you've been faithful that's okay, that wasn't something that you could control. Now, if you've been unfaithful to a friend, but there's not peace between you because of something you have done, then we have a responsibility as Christ followers, as examples, as lights, to, to humble ourselves and swallow our pride, as hurtful as it may be, and go and apologize. And if they are harsh, and they don't apologize for what, they, for what they've done, you, you need to let that go. I need to let that go. We need to go and make amends for what we have done. So I have shared, and Avery in his video also shared, that and Natalie too, if you've watched my video with Natalie um, on friendships, I um, suggest you watch our video talking about our relationships with these things as well. We have all done things that We've and said things uh, in a tone that, that was harsh, or we have said things that we should not have said in our heart and our desire to bring them back. And so we went and said, hey, that was wrong. I'm sorry, I should not have done that. I had a friend that I was talking to, trying to keep relationship with, and uh, this woman had, and friend had revealed to me that she had been crossing out words in her Bible, specifically one word. And I, I said something to the effect that she told me later um, when we had met for coffee down the road, she shared with me how much my words hurt her because she, I don't remember this, but I believe her. I'm going to say she was absolutely truthful and I believe her. She said that I, I told her that she was dra dragging Jesus through the mud. I do believe that these beliefs in the Hebrew Roots movement undermine the New Testament. They undermine the cross and what Jesus has done. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But when we are speaking to someone that we love and respect, and they love and respect us, 
our words in emotional times can be a boulder uh, at their heart. And it wasn't uh, fruitful. Maybe you're listening and thinking, well, that's not the harshest thing to say. Well, maybe not, but it wasn't fruitful. It wasn't beneficial. And if we are going to speak truth, sometimes the truth hurts. The truth cuts like a sword. That is a good cut. Sometimes we have to cut people with the truth, but the truth has its own sharpness. The sword of truth is sharp enough without us trying to stick a second dagger in there. And so my words, dragging Jesus through the mud, this is what you're doing in this increased impassioned tone, um, was hurtful. I made amends for that. I told her that I was sorry for saying that. And so if you have done anything like that, less or worse, if it hurt them, um, or if you think it might have, go and make amends and repair that so that you can walk as blamelessly as you can in witness, in good witness, and good faithfulness. Now, unfortunately, sometimes when we speak the truth um, or we contend, me making these videos has caused an offense. Never mentioned any names, never will, no need for that. Not fruitful, not beneficial, not necessary. But even me just contesting causes a great offense. It causes a cut. But to warn people of this movement is biblical. To lovingly and gently say, this is what has happened. This is my testimony. Not throwing people under the bus, but sharing my experience. Some of those experiences are personal, but pointing out individuals is not necessary. But even in that, that was a cut and a hurt and such a great offense that those relationships could not be salvaged. I came out of the movement. My two closest friends I met face to face. Another dear friend I was able to meet with face to face, three out of five. And I met them each individually, person to person, face to face, uh, so they could see me, hear me read my tone, read my body language, uh, no text, no emails, face to face, and to tell them that they were deceived and what we had walked was not true and I was stepping out and I was warning them. And we met for two to three hours a time. Um, at the end of these meetings, um, there was a hug and, and, and kindness and, and parting on good terms. And then a few days later, what I had told them was rejected, that they still believe. And so after this, we tried, my husband and I were in the small group with them. We stayed till May. And in trying to work this out with our closest, uh, we were thrown out of the group. We were told, if you don't believe this, why are you here? Just leave. So we left. And we knew we needed to step out at some point because we weren't in agreement. So it wasn't going to be fruitful for us to stay. But for months, we stayed. For months, I text, texted, met for coffee, video chatted to try to stay in a relationship, to try to work out personal things. And it didn't work. The truth was consistently rejected. As many of you know, I did an interview on Defending the Biblical Roots of Christianity, Rob Solberg's channel. And when that interview was released, and I knew this, I knew this might happen, this is part of that risk, but after that interview was released, it was such an offense. And let me just say, you all, if we put, I'm in Oklahoma, y'all. <laughs> so let me just say, y'all, if we are to put ourselves in their shoes, can we honestly say we'd be offended too? Probably. Because you're having loss, I'm having loss in relationships, but they are too. And so we need to keep that in mind, that we are wounded and hurt, so are they. They've lost you, right? They feel they've lost you. And deception is so blinding that sometimes, even when we don't say names, when we're contending for the faith, when we're fighting against the, the belief system, right? Because we do not fight against people. You can tell in comments if someone is truly with all their heart fighting against a concept or a belief system or whether they're fighting against people. And you see this in the, the tone, kindness, love, 
Is there name calling, harshness, all caps, yelling? <laughs> um, you can tell if someone's speaking in love because and attacking the belief system, but not people. So when that interview was released, it was such an offense that I lost those relationships. And at this point, watching publicly others come in, some I know, some I don't, say, look, this looks agnostic. Would you talk with me publicly? And there's a refusal to meet publicly. Um, they'll only meet privately. And others coming in to warn them, to speak with them, to implore them, please, I come as a, a witness, I come as a friend, I come to tell you that this is deception. Um, seeing that rejected over and over, I have now taken a stance with those in, in my area who have rejected my message to them over and over that I am stepping away from those relationships. Now, those relationships have closed doors on me in some ways, but here's what I will say. When I look at the example of Paul, I see, and I've already lost like half the crowd if Hebrew roots are watching, but when I, when I follow the example of Paul, he does not chase down the wolves. If you find an incident where he chases down the wolves, post it here. I am, I am okay to be corrected. Guys, I'm always okay to be corrected. That's why I don't delete posts. <laughs> Even if they're mean, I, I typically just leave them there. Um, you have a right to speak and I, I'll hear you. But I don't see any example of where Paul chases down the wolves. You know, what he does do, though, is he warns. He warns. He, he writes to the churches. He goes to the churches and he says, keep on keeping on. Walk in faith. Walk in the Holy Spirit. Stay in step with the Spirit love one another. My goodness, the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John is where we find walk as Jesus walked. And Hebrew roots will take that and say, that means follow Torah. That means follow Sabbath. That means keep all these things. Okay, Jesus was Jewish. He kept the law perfectly, but what was the most important thing that Jesus ever did is he kept the law perfectly morally. He kept the law outwardly and he kept it inside. He is who we are to follow. He is who we are to become. There is a woman named Christy McClelland. She has a Bible study called Gospel on the Ground. If you have not read it or watched her videos, um, there is, I think her first session is free on YouTube. After that, you can purchase her. I believe she's with Lifeway. She gives a beautiful account of being like your rabbi, of being like Jesus Christ, that they were following the dust of his feet, the dust of his robes, that we want to become like him. We want to be like him. We want the heart of Jesus. We want the character of Jesus. We want to love like he loved. We want to be like him. And in the Gospel of John, the entire context, the entire context of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is to love one another. Let no hate be there. That is who we want to be, like our, like our King, like our Savior. When we are contending and we're wanting relationship, that character of goodness and kindness and love that we used to see in a friend is not there. We can't be in the New Covenant and the Old Covenant at the same time. Did you know that? We cannot be alive with Christ in the New Covenant and dead in the Old Covenant. We can't be alive and dead. We can't be alive and dead. We come alive in the blood of Jesus Christ in his New Covenant. Yes, we produce works. Our works come from our faith. Faith without works is dead. But it's, do we know, do we understand what those works are? Do we understand that those works are not mosaic law keeping so far as those outward 
feasts and festivals and moons and Sabbaths? How many times have God, has God said that those sicken him? He desires mercy, not sacrifice. That he wants us to listen to his voice, which by the way, the final word of the new covenant is in Jesus Christ, that the transfiguration, the Father's voice comes down from heaven and says, this is my son, listen to him with an exclamation point. We were always, the Jews and us were always to follow his voice. And at one point in time, he directed a certain people for a certain time to follow his voice in a certain way. And they didn't. We follow his voice. The principle remains. The principle is love, loving one another, loving God with all our hearts. We're not chasing after other gods. Our hearts aren't following after idols and other things. And we are loving one another. Because to love one another is to love God. That is why... The entire law is fulfilled in love your neighbor as yourself because our Heavenly Father wants us to love each other the way that Jesus loved us. And that fulfills the entire law. We see that when our friends, our loved ones in Hebrew roots, go from the new covenant back to the old covenant, do we not see them start to die? Who once, those who were once alive in the Holy Spirit, in love and friendship and kindness and gentleness, do we not see a change? There are so many that are sharing stories with me. I will read an email from some of you and I just break down and cry. I have sat with some of you in Bible study and cried with you as you've cried out because of the spiritual abuse you're facing from someone who used to be kind to you, from someone who used to love you and is now being manipulative, abusive, unkind, harsh, calling you lawless, from friends to children to spouses. Those that we loved who were once our friends are changing. They're changing before our eyes because when you go from the new covenant, alive in Christ, loving one another, and you trade it for law, and you start to go back, we're going back to death, you all. We're, we, we're walking back to death when we do that. Because when we were dead in Christ, we didn't understand his love. Did you know that in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, when Paul is talking about the mystery of Christ, that there's a prerequisite here, that we must be grounded and rooted in love and the love of Jesus Christ to understand it? So no wonder... When we trade law, when we trade our love for law, our love begins to grow cold. And so when you are faithful, when you are faithful in your friendships and you are, you are speaking kindly and sharing the gospel, when you're sharing a testimony, sometimes you're going to lose a relationship. Sometimes you're going to lose the relationship. And we need to realize that Sometimes we face a choice, and that choice is to stay silent and allow a loved one to go down a road of deception, which is not what we're called to do. And we have a choice to go perhaps trembling, sweaty, shaking, afraid we're going to lose that relationship, and go in faithfully, which means kindly in the gospel, firmly, boldly, but kindly, lovingly, faithfully, with grace, patience and grace, draw them back and hopefully if you can if you can you're gonna stay in that relationship and continue to have biblical talks maybe you're staying in that relationship and you go out and and you go out for coffee or you go on a double date or you go do something and it's really awkward and it's really shallow if they're willing to stay in relationship and you can have peace I say have it have it but when, if you've been faithful to the gospel and let them know that you believe they are deceived and you've gently tried to lead them out and they've rejected you, but there's still a kindness and peace, okay, be there for them. Every time a door opens, try to bring them back again, lovingly. If it's going to be shallow and awkward, it's shallow and awkward, but you're in their lives, right? 
you're a light in their lives. But sometimes, even when you're faithful, you'll face rejection. If you're facing volatility, again, we're talking about friendships. I have a video on marriage and dating, different situations. Go watch those for different information. But for friendships, if there is volatility, if there is harshness, if there's constant insult or abuse, shake the dust off and go. You have permission biblically to shake the dust off and go. Paul says for those preaching another gospel, let them be anathema. Let them be accursed. I would think Paul loving the Lord would say, let them be anathema. But I can imagine him having to excuse himself sometimes and just weep and weep for those who are lost and weep for those who rejected the truth. So going back, we do not see an example for us set out that we're chasing down the wolves. If we're meeting someone who is a Judaizer, modern day Pharisee, modern day Judaizer, which is, I believe, what Hebrew roots are, modern day Judaizers, if they are saying that you must do things for salvation or obedience, it ends up meaning the same thing. If they are trying to do this for obedience, to, to not be lawless, it's going to come back to salvation. So consider that, in my opinion, the same thing from my experience. But we don't continue to chase them. We don't need to attack them. But here's our example laid out before us. When we see Christians who are going down a road of sin or deception, we gently bring them back. We gently restore. We bear one another's burdens. So we help carry each other's sin as we're leading each other out of it. In that, if you are caught up in something and you're trying to get out and you don't have the strength, we bear it. We stay with you. We put our arm around you. We pray for each other, right? We don't give up. We don't give up on each other. So when Paul says, let them be anathema, I don't believe you stop praying for those people. What we can say is this, this relationship needs to end for now. I'm, I'm letting you go. I'm handing you over. But I am allowing myself to remain sensitive to that person. I'm allowing my heart to stay broken for that person because that brokenness and that love and that tenderness and that unwillingness to be desensitized leads me to still get on my knees every single morning and night and pray for them. So I have lost my relationships here. After years. And at this point, I have said, if they want to go back to the law of sin and death, I am letting them go. I am letting them go. Uh, I hope that someday my prayer for your loved ones and mine is that when their sight is restored, they can hear the grace in our voices, right? Because now it's just a fence. When their sight is restored, they can see that our contending for the faith for them, even publicly, no names, <laughs> even publicly, was not an attack against them. It was a proclamation for them. All of this is for them. It's for our loved ones, compelling them to please hear the truth. Because this road starts so seductively, it is alluring, it is beauty. How are we told that the enemy masquerades? He doesn't masquerade as something ugly. He doesn't masquerade as something undesirable. The enemy disguises himself as light, beauty, enchantment, desirable, looks gentle, looks harmless, but it's not. And if you know, you know. If you've walked this personally or watched someone go through it, you know. You know it's not of God because you see the fruits of the Spirit exchanged for works of the law. You've watched the eyes 
change of your loved ones, right? Their very eyes change. You look at them and they're no longer the same person uh, on the inside. Something's different. You see division happen, strain on relationships. You see outward elements elevated above love, above relationship, above each other in families and in friendships. And unfortunately, what that means is we'll see them go down a road that eventually leads to giving up Paul as an apostle, who Jesus Christ appeared to himself and called him as an apostle, as a follower, commissioned by Jesus. And Paul was humble. He said, don't you dare follow me. <laughs> you follow Jesus, don't follow me. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. This is a humble man serving our Lord <laughs> who took beatings and floggings and, and prison because he counted the people of God so much more important than himself. So they're getting rid of Paul. Then they've got to twist the words of Jesus to make them match. Eventually it doesn't cut it anymore, so you've got to cut out Christ. And some are turning to Judaism, some full atheism after that. So we know where this road goes. So we need to contend. We need to contend. My relationships here have ended for now. And when they turn back, when I came out, I, I called a friend and I said, hey, you know what? I think I've been wrong. Will you walk through this with me? I want to talk about this. I want to talk about what I'm, what I'm seeing here. A friend in the gospel is like, will you go through this with me? A few days later, I was out of that movement. If I ever get that call, all is forgiven, all is gone, and I will be the first to welcome them back into my life and into my friendship, no questions asked. But for those of you who still have relationship, who have peace, so long as you have been faithful to the gospel, faithful to Christ, and you have shared with them that they you believe they're deceived, you have shared with them that they are, they are going down the wrong road and they are leaving Christ behind. And if they are still willing to talk about scripture with you, if they are still willing to allow you in their lives, have peace. Have peace. Continue to gently restore. Sometimes that's just shallow, awkward relationship, but it's relationship. You do not have to make the choice that I have made because of their choices to reject the truth. You don't have to make that choice until it's time, <laughs> until there's abuse or volatility or a continual rejection of your words for Christ. You don't have to go down that road. Um, keep peace where you can. Keep peace, but not at any cost not at the cost of the truth, not at the cost of the gospel. But however you contend and however you lose a relationship, make sure it's because you were faithful to the gospel, not unfaithful. One last word of encouragement to contend for the faith, to share the gospel, to gently lead them out. 1 Corinthians 9, Legacy Standard Bible Versus NIV, I'll read both. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For if I proclaim the gospel, I have nothing to boast, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not proclaim the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, NIV. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach or share. Woe to me if I do not preach preach the gospel. So listen, the Holy Spirit compels us to share the gospel. The Holy Spirit compels us to speak truth. And we don't want to let our flesh get in the way, our fears of loss of relationship uh, get in the way of going to someone we love and saying, hey, come back, come back, right? Whether it's sin or deception, come back. 
because we are compelled. And Paul says, woe to me if I don't share the gospel. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. I am so compelled. Are we not so compelled in our love for our friends and family that we share the gospel? So do so with boldness, but kindness. Put on those boots of peace because the sword is sharp. The sword is sharp enough without us bringing an extra dagger. So put on the boots of peace. Speak the truth with a mouthful of grace. Be patient and keep unity and peace wherever possible so long as it depends on you. But sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes even with the boots of peace, the sword is too sharp uh, for them to handle. And they may come at you with aggression, volatility, accusations, name calling, and in that case, it is okay to say, let them be, let them be.